Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening I'm, I'm joined by Greg Lukianoff, and we're going to be talking about freedom of speech on campuses specifically. Greg, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you're with FIRE, mm -hmm. uh, and FIRE stands for? Well, I'm the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and we defend free speech, due process, and basic rights on American college campuses. So why are those important, and how did you get involved with that? Well, I went to law school specifically to do First Amendment law. Um, I've been a lifelong fan of freedom of speech. My, my dad's a Russian immigrant, my mom's a British immigrant, and if they had their way, they, I'd, I wouldn't be allowed to say different things with, with Russian and British perspectives. So free speech being a rule made immediate sense to me uh, as a kid coming from these you know really divergent backgrounds and so I was the weird law student I went to Stanford um, and who came in wanting to do First Amendment law so I specialized in it the entire time um, I even uh, volunteered at the ACLU of Northern California I, I, I did credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty and when I graduated I, I was recruited for this new organization fire and despite all of my experience um, and knowing a lot about the history of freedom of speech globally, I was not prepared for the kind of things that could get you in trouble on the modern college campus. Tell me about that. Give me some examples of the thought police running rampant and stopping people from expressing themselves. Well, I wrote a book called Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate, and it comes out in paperback uh, on March 11th. Okay. Um, and it, uh, it, you know, it's hard for me to relate so many of these stories, but I'll give you a couple of couple, you know, famous examples. I'll give you a, one that just settled uh, ver just very recently uh, to show you how bad it's gotten. There was a student at Modesto Junior College, and obviously Modesto, who was stopped from handing out uh, by the school um, from, from handing out copies of the Constitution in the public areas to celebrate Constitution Day. Okay. And so that's offensive to people. <laughs> no, I've, I've handed out constitutions at parades, and you can actually really offend people. We've had, we also had, at the same time, virtually the same time, we had a case in Hawaii where students were being told that they couldn't hand out copies of the Constitution. And, you know, as bad as that is, the fact that this doesn't revolt, uh, re re resort in full-scale student re revolt, the fact that they kind of take the, the, these kind of punishments for granted or, or these kind of prohibitions for granted shows you just how, how, how far down we've come. Well... The Constitution has crazy stuff in it, like <laughs> yes. the First Amendment. And, and, you, you, don't, you, you don't want people knowing that they have those kinds of... And the Third Amendment. You yeah. Know. So, so those are the kinds of cases that you uh, will chase after. But you and I were talking a little bit before the show. Mm -hmm. You'll actually go after other things that maybe you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all about the First Amendment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, the, the, I, I worry about the polarization of our society because um, I take it for granted that uh, it's almost like cheating if you're a First Amendment defender to only defend opinions you agree with. Um, that, that, that's not the point. We don't right. need that. We have enough partisan people. So FIRE is, is passionately nonpartisan, and we defend uh, views all across the political spectrum. But even though we're, willing, we're perfectly happy to defend truly offensive uh, speech, it's so easy to get in trouble on a college campus. And so, but, but freedom of speech goes beyond just handing out pamphlets. Yep. What kinds of other things are people saying out there that you've had to defend against or you would have gladly taken the case if you were right. required to? Well, it's it, it, uh, probably one of the most famous cases uh, that, that we've had, the extent to which we've ever had sort of a famous case, that I talk about in the book, but it just bears repeating, is a student at a, uh, at a public college in Indiana was reading a book called Notre Dame versus the Klan. The book is about the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. It's celebrates the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924, but he was found guilty of racial harassment because the cover was found offensive by an employee. Because it had the K word on it. Because it had the K word on it. Wow. And so even people who are trying to do their best to be good citizens end up in trouble in this this new era of political correctness. Absolutely. It, it, it's, like, it, it's almost like on campuses people have just sort of moved to a hair trigger. Yeah. And so... Um, you talk about the polarization and this whole political correctness has driven it. Mm -hmm. What what kinds of things have you seen as actual or are people even trying to remedy the situation on college campuses? And when you do litigate against them, are you able to affect their policies in any way to allow common sense to exist on their campuses? Well, I'm very proud of how successful FIRE has been. We win the overwhelming majority of cases we fight. Um, okay. And we primarily fight them through public awareness. Uh, we take a case public, we do a press release about it, and the university backs down. The problem is, though, 
that politically correct speech codes um, came into existence in the 1980s, and there, it's popularly believed that these things came and went, um, that they were defeated in the courts. There, there was one at Stanford, by the way, which was defeated two years before I started there, back in 1995. Um, and so, but amazingly, when we did our most recent survey of, of over 400 uh, top universities, we found that 59% of them maintain codes that are laughably unconstitutional. And keep in mind that that's an improvement from when we started doing this. What kind of policies would fall into that category of wildly unconstitutional? Because, I mean, we hear all the time that people are, are upset because of the limitation of speech on campuses mm -hmm. and that only one view is represented and that it's not about how to think, it's what to think. Give me some examples of those policies that are sure. egregious. Uh, I mean, there are just so many of them. Uh, we, we, we list them at thefire.org. We actually have a speech code of the month every month since 2005, and we're in no danger of running out of material. But to give you some examples, sure. um, one of my favorites, because it was so tenacious, believe it or not, was a ban on inappropriately directed laughter. Really? University of Connecticut had this ha had this policy. It was defeated. It had to go to a court to be defeated. Amazingly, University of Connecticut was like, yep, this code makes sense. Let's defend it. And of course, it was shot down by a court. But amazingly, Drexel University um, in Philadelphia, where FIRE has its headquarters, uh, took this policy uh, in total and put it back in its, uh, in its own policies until FIRE uh, brought some, you know, maybe inappropriately directed laughter towards it. And I would be so expelled. From, oh, well, <laughs> from, yeah. From well, and what scares me the most is when I talk about these codes on campus, and some of them, you know, uh, th they're so vague. They talk about creating, like, a vague sense of unease. You know, like, they're, they're so subjective. But students have gotten so used to these kind of codes that uh, I have to explain to, you know, the students who come to my speeches, every single one of you is guilty of violating this code, at least arguably, and at least arguably enough to get in trouble. Right. So, morbid curiosity, what kind of cases have you lost? What kind of cases have we lost? Um, over the years, I think that probably some, in some cases the hardest schools to fight are the um, uh, are, are the small community colleges um, because they in some cases they're not all that concerned about their reputation um, and you know they they think they have job security and I and that actually got me thinking about what you need to achieve um, in order to actually start uh, setting things right on college campuses and one thing that you need is you need to start creating consequences for bad administrators like what. Well, there was a case, I opened up the, my, my book on learning liberty talking about a case where a student, and it's, I can't do it justice, like even in the full half hour, um, where a student was kicked out of college for protesting a parking garage with a collage he put on Facebook. He was kicked out of school for this. And when it all came out, it turned out that the university president was so obsessed with starting this parking garage um, that he wasn't bearing any criticism of it whatsoever. It's completely just... Narcissistic. Yes. Uh, that's, that's my design, my baby. No one will call my baby ugly. It's exactly. It's really, really strange, uh, str uh, strange behavior in this case. And that case was considered so bad by a court that they pierced what's called qualified immunity, which means that, at least in theory, the president should pay out of his own pocket because he was so clearly ignoring the Constitution. And if administrators could start to realize or, or, or start to actually believe that they might be held personally responsible for some of these abuses, we might start seeing some change. Well, and I think that that can go way beyond just the situation of, of college campuses. That's something that should be universally applicable. Absolutely. If you're that stupid, you should pay a consequence. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and when it comes to it, you know, if we had more students willing to fight their speech codes, we, we could make short work of speech codes, I believe. But right. unfortunately, I think sometimes students think it's a lot harder and a lot scarier to actually be part, uh, party to some of these lawsuits. Well, because they're also concerned about retaliation. Yes. And, and so is that the primary driver for people just complying? Is they're concerned about retaliation or? I think it's, I think it's a, a little bit of human. I mean, or, uh, for them to, to file suit or whatever. I, I think honestly, you know, you know I think uh, why, why would they not want to file yeah. suit? I think they're under the misimpression that it's a lot harder to be in a lawsuit than it is. And they also are afraid of retaliation, in which we point out, if you file a lawsuit and the university you know, kicks you out or suddenly you get all Fs or, or you know, they're only going to get sued that much more after the fact once and so sometimes I think you, you, students think go along to get along keep your head low and I have to explain to them time and time again the students who say that are the ones that I talk to in, in private begging them to take their case public or to litigate and those are the ones who end up being kicked out those are the ones who end up or if their professors losing their jobs mm -hmm. 
because they haven't stood up for themselves. And, and you're much safer in public. And I've seen this happen a million times. If you're not willing to go go in public, they can quietly get rid of you. Meanwhile, if you're being covered in the local newspapers or better yet, the national uh, national press, you're a lot safer. So when do you make the decision that something's a local case versus a national case, or does the media decide for you? You know that that's a, that's a really great question. It can it can be really funny because we deal with so many cases every year. I mean, we get we get 500 case submissions a year, and in addition to that, we you know we find cases from all different sources. And when you take a case public that you you know within fire, we might think, oh my goodness, this is an absolutely ridiculous case. Um, the press might not care, and then randomly you, you discover one um, that the uh, that the press just kind of kind of runs with for some reason that you didn't entirely understand. Like a case that I felt like never got really enough attention. For one, the, the Indiana case, I felt like never got quite enough attention, which is one of the reasons why I mention it all the time. But, but <laughs> you're, you're making up for that attention <laughs> yeah. that wasn't gotten before. Exactly. But, you know, but University of Cincinnati, this is a case where a student, um, a, a libertarian student group, they were trying to get signatures for a ballot initiative, a uh, right to work ballot initiative. And they were told, and they and, and they needed to get it before you know before the deadline. And they were told that not only could they not uh, get ballot, uh, so, you know, petition the government for redress of grievances, which might sound familiar to you, um, that they had to get advanced state permission ten days in advance in order to use the free speech zone that was only 0.1 percent of campus, and that if they were seen quote unquote walking around campus, these are students, mind you, that they would be arrested for trespass. In a school that they pay to attend. In a school, they pay, in a public school, they pay to attend. It's just wildness. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you were tracking the Berkeley case. Uh, I mean, there wasn't really a case mm -hmm. at all, but seeing what the Berkeley students did about their um, their racially motivated bake sale at all. And um, if you thought that that was going to be something coming your way, or we, affirmative action bake sales, which uh, you know people might not, might not know about them, they're a way of sort of satirizing affirmative action. Sure. Um, and the point is to actually anger people by charging different prices to, uh, for people according to race. Now they're suggested it's just completely parody, but to make a point, right. and it's effective in getting people angry. Uh, John Stossel actually conducted his own affirmative action bake sale in the streets of New York, and then he watched it as, as it produced a lot of debate. These things have been going on for a really long time, right. and we've uh, uh, we've intervened in a lot of them. Um, and we've also pointed out that a lot of these colleges do what are called also at the same time do gender gap bake sales, which charge people different money, uh, different amounts of money according to whether they're male or female to protest the gender gap in, 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 in pay. And those never get in trouble. But when you change the opinion, when it's actually one that's uh, anti-affirmative action, uh, you, uh, that's when students start landing in trouble. And the point that I made, the, the, there was a UC Irvine shut down one of these bake sales um, uh, very early on. And I remember you know, talking to the press about this, like, listen, if you really want to make a cause famous, censor it. Because the, the students who actually had this bake sale are suddenly known all over the country because you censored it. Mm -hmm. um, allowing them to have their legitimate protest is, one, your duty, but two, it's also, you know, you know it, will, it, it, it keeps the message, uh, it, you know, as a discussion among students for the most part. So have you noticed in your practice recurring themes, uh -huh. specific things that you, I mean, do you see more of the I love Hitler types of students that you have to <laughs> right. uh, represent or more the religious freedom types? Yep. What what trends do you see and across the country? Well, it's it, you know, I always say, like, I'm willing to defend hateful speech, um, but the students who get in trouble on college campuses, nine times out of ten, are really nice kids because it's so easy to get in trouble on, on college campuses that it even pulls in the nice kids kids. But I've definitely seen, it, it goes in waves, and there are trends, free speech zones are mm -hmm. a trend, which I've mentioned a couple times. It definitely, and my, you know, my, my liberal friends hate me saying this, but it definitely, you de are definitely more likely to get in trouble for a socially conservative opinion, which I think will really come as a, a surprise to nobody. Right. Um, but also, you know, we had a, a, a phase there where people were using their First Amendment rights to argue for their Second Amendment rights. Um, and we had a whole. We actually did a whole video about cases in which students were getting in trouble for protesting for like concealed carry, for example, mm -hmm. um, or and, open carry even uh, too. Yeah, or or, or or open carry, for example. Um, the uh, and, and then you just have well, you know crazy one-off cases that are that are sort of fun. We, we, we had a case that involved a professor getting in trouble for a quote from the uh, much beloved but short-lived TV show Firefly. 
Okay. And that was a really funny case to watch because um, it, when he got in trouble for it, this brought all the fans, including myself, like I'm a huge fan of this uh, of this defunct show, this is Joss Whedon show, okay. and you have you know, tens of thousands of angry fans suddenly are coming in. And, but what that case drove home to me was that, you know, you hit a beloved TV show and suddenly everybody's all up in arms. But, you know, I wish we had that same consistency, uh, constituency just for free speech on college campuses. Right. And so um, as far as your book goes, mm -hmm. uh, you, you go into all of these different stories. Do you have uh, something that you want people to leave with or, or an idea, a concept, how to fight? Yep. The, the, for their freedom of speech? Um, well, the, the, the two things uh, are pretty well represented by the title. Unlearning liberty, but by that I mean that students are learning all the wrong lessons of what it lives, uh, means to live in a free society. Okay. And that scares me. Mm -hmm. The end of American debate part of it is how this censorship actually encourages people to just talk to the people they already agree with, thus fostering polarization, which you can really see on campus and in, in our society. But the way to fight back is to get educated, um, to uh, to talk across lines of difference. That makes a huge difference. Be you know, be reasonable, host debates, um, and be willing to litigate if it comes down to it. And if, and as I said before, if more students were willing to willing to do that, I think we could really make some positive changes for campus. And how much? How many of your cases actually go to the litigation stage versus the court of? public opinion? Very few. We, we don't like to primarily rely on, on litigation, but because I think one of the reasons why this has gotten so out of hand is because university general counsels think in some cases it's uh, safer to punish students or to, or, or to stifle students than it is to, uh, to protect their rights, that you have to change that, uh, uh, that incentive structure. And, I think, and I'm, unfortunately, I think the only ways you're really going to achieve that is, one, more litigation, and two, possibly some legislative fixes. Some, some of simple as just defining, you know, for example, harassment. Right. Harassment is defined on campuses and has been defined on campuses, um, including Stanford, um, since 1989 in these wildly overbroad ways that, that bear no resemblance to the legal definition of harassment. If, the, uh, if Congress were to just pass a rule that said harassment means what the Supreme Court said harassment means in the 1999 case of Davis, um, it, would, uh, it would eliminate, you know, a substantial portion of speech codes in one fell swoop. So what was the definition of by the Supreme Court in 1999 in the Davis case? <laughs> in the Davis case. Um, severe, persistent, and pervasive, um, that it's targeted and unwelcome speech. Um, if it, and this is a, it was a student-on-student -student case in, in, uh, involving, actually in this case, K-12 through 12, uh, uh, students. And by that uh, strong definition, it's no longer really speech. It really is her harassing behavior. Harassment, hazing, something. It goes uh, much more than just, you appended me. Exactly. Right. And if, if the Congress were to adopt that definition, and, and uh, we're, we hope they will, that would eliminate a lot of the ambiguity around this. And so are there movements to take legislative directions uh, with this type of freedom of speech violation? Uh, fire is alone in a lot of different ways, and one of the ways in which we're alone is on the Hill, trying to argue for some of these common sense changes. The nice thing is... That's the problem. You try to bring common sense <laughs> to Capitol Hill, shame on you. I, bet, I have to tell you, though, that there, there have been a bunch of... Uh, that, the Virginia um, uh, state uh, government um, just passed a bill uh, that uh, pr protects free speech on college campuses, um, uh, addressing the problem of free speech zones. So we've had... Uh, the, the, there, there, there is more common sense, I think, believe it or not, I think there is more common sense in Washington or in state governments than there is on campus in a lot of different ways. That's a scary statement Isn't all in it? itself, but we'll allow you to freely speak <laughs> it here. Uh, so talk to me about free speech zones. Mm -hmm. Having been a recovering politician, yep. uh, you're always, they always try to attempt to regulate where you can stand, and they want it to be where no one can hear you anyway. That's the yep. freedom of speech zone, because you're by yourself anyway, nobody cares. Yep. So what is your thought on freedom, or free speech zones, and should they even be constitutionally allowed? There is such a thing as a, as a perfectly constitutional free speech zone policy. Um, so, for example, University of Texas had one that I have no problem with. I actually thought it was a good one, which limited to relatively large zones the, uh, on campus um, the areas in which you could use amplification equipment. That's perfectly reasonable, saying, like, listen, we don't want classes to be disrupted. This is where you can use amplification. Um, and what, but what's ironic about free speech zones is they started, you know, as best we can tell in the 60s and 70s, as an additional place you could always have free speech. And somehow in the 80s, 90s, uh, they morphed into the only place you were allowed to have free speech.
So why is that just a curious historical reference? I mean, why would someone need a place where they could always have free speech? Why should it be limited at all? Well, it, it, as, as long as it's not the only place, um, then, then it's fine. Then it's nice. It's like sp uh, Speaker's Corner in, in, in London, and that's and that's pretty cool. Uh, but with the mass bureaucratization of campuses, they've kind of over-regulated everything. And a lot of people don't know that the number of people involved in administration full-time past the number of people involved in instruction on college campuses really? in 2005. And the trend lines just keep getting worse and worse. So it, you have to have more personnel for compliance than you have for educating students, yep. which explains the cost of education. Yep. Soundly, I would think they're 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 all connected. So so I think it's particularly galling that we have we're paying more f than ever to have larger armies of uh, campus administrators and bureaucrats um, who promise very little in the way of due process and very little in the way of free speech. And actually, because there's so many of them, you get less and less, and, and you get more and more um, uh, sort of babysitting mentality. Incredible, yep. and that's how bureaucracy works generally. Yep. So. Um, we have a few minutes left. Talk to us about, uh, you've, you've talked about legislative uh, ways that you might address things. We now dub you king of the world. I'm free to say that. I don't support the whole royalty thing. <laughs> but um, are there any other things we should be thinking about or any other movements people could get behind to educate the the country specifically about how they can fight for freedom of speech. The biggest, the, the biggest goal of fire is to is to change the culture. I'm I'm afraid that freedom of speech, and there's unfortunately research that indicates this, that for the younger generation, First Amendment and freedom of speech doesn't have the same kind of. It's because they're not allowed to read the Constitution. <laughs> well, right. Uh, grandeur that it used to, but I think if we were to, as far as different ways we could actually really help, what if you had enduring orientation, proper Oxford style debates where you actually have to take the other side of a, 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 of a point of view um, and, uh, and on, defend it, but on a genuinely controversial topic. Yes, um, I, I, I spoke about this up at Harvard, by the way, and a student came up to me and said, "I was trying to do this, but they wouldn't let us have the <laughs> other side." And I was like, "That's crazy." Right. Um, so I think that that would be great training um, because it's hard to view someone you disagree with after you've put yourself in their shoes as being crazy, um, and it really helps you appreciate the the, the value of uh, thought experimentation of devil advocacy of all these things that make that uh, that make ideas better right and so but it also requires not getting along with everybody that you you run into right and that's countercultural at this point too we're we're told we need to get along and we need to respect others opinions we're not but that means don't share yours. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 been amazing. I mean, you know, with regards to trends that I, I I didn't manage to talk about. You know, I'm not particularly religious, but it definitely has been the case that you know how often I've had to come to defend evangelical Christians on, on college campuses. I mean, like that. If you told me that I'd, I'd spend a lot of time doing that before I work for Fire, I'd be like, oh, that's got to be some kind of myth. Um, but now that I've, now that having done it for 12 years, I'm just stunned. And so they're going to bring you over to, to the religious side eventually. It'll happen because you have to keep defending. So just so people can um, learn more about you and what's going on, uh, the name of the book again is? Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship, and the End of American Debate. And they can find out about it at your website? Uh, at at thefire.org, uh, Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Okay, great. Well, Greg, thanks for joining us this evening. And if you hold on for just a second, we'll be back after a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. 
We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. And the Conservative Forum, as much as we appreciate them underwriting the show, that's not actually what they're best known for. What they are best known for is their speaker series. And that's the reason we were lucky enough to have Greg with us in the studio this evening. He's the speaker at the Forum tonight. The Forum usually meets the first Tuesday of each month. And that happens, and that will be changing in November. But other than that, only in July is it different. Uh, but they meet at 432 Stearland Road here in Mountain View at the IFES Portuguese Hall, about three minutes from the studio. And just so you know, upcoming speakers also include in April on the 1st, Dr. Bert Folsom from Hillsdale. In May, speaking of free speech, Sheriff Joe Arpaio will be speaking, and that's sure to bring some freedom of speech not only inside the halls, but probably outside too. Uh, in June, Nani Darwish, founder of Arabs for Israel, and then August 5th, there will be a meeting uh, about the, or, uh, that'll be spoken at by Gun Owners of America. There's lots to see, lots of freedom of speech expressed at the forum. So please join us there. Shows usually start around, I think doors open at 6.30 and the actual presentation starts at 7. You can learn more at the Conservative Forum if I for, at the Conservative Forum dot com if I've forgotten anything. But in closing, I just wanted to point out that freedom of speech is something that's vital to us as citizens of the United States and we sometimes take for granted that we have that right or we take for granted that we're letting it slip away piece by piece and inch by inch where we really do need to stand up and protect it. So learn more about at thefire.org, learn more about Greg and his book, and we uh, encourage you to get involved in the fight, uh, because if you don't protect your freedom of speech and exercise it regularly, no one else will do it for you. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening on The Right Side. Again, I've been your host, Chris Pareja, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in person or on the show sometime soon. Thanks. <laughs>